live from the District of Columbia. You are listening to the Black Fundraisers Podcast, a weekly podcast that celebrates, inspires, and equips Black fundraisers to excel and positively impact Black communities. With your host, Kia Kroon. Good day, good people. Welcome to season two of the Black Fundraisers Podcast. My name is Kia Kroon, and I am the founder and host of the Black Fundraisers Podcast, your weekly podcast that celebrates, inspires, and equips Black fundraisers to positively impact Black communities. If this is your first time tuning in, I'd like to welcome you into a growing global community of listeners and subscribers. And I also want to thank you for tuning in. As I always say, you could be anywhere in the world in these internet streets, so I am absolutely thrilled to know that you're listening. Good people, we are in the midst of a special five-part series entitled Exploring Racial Justice in Philanthropy. And throughout this series, I've been having conversations with Black philanthropy executives centered on racial equity and racial justice in philanthropy. And what that looks like, not just in this critical moment in time, but for the long haul. Today's guest is Dr. Helene Gale, President and CEO of the Chicago Community Trust, one of the nation's oldest and largest community foundations, where she's been in leadership since 2017. Under Dr. Gale's leadership, the trust has adopted a new strategic focus on closing the racial and ethnic wealth gap in the Chicago region. For almost a decade, Dr. Gale was president and CEO of CARE, a leading international humanitarian organization. An expert on global development, humanitarian and health issues, she spent 20 years with the Centers for Disease Control working primarily on HIV and AIDS. She worked at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, directing programs on HIV and AIDS and other global health issues. Dr. Gale serves on public company and nonprofit boards, including the Coca-Cola Company, Organon, Palo Alto Networks, Brookings Institution, Center for Strategic and International Studies, New America, One Campaign, Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago, and Economic Club of Chicago. She is a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, Council on Foreign Relations, American Public Health Association, National Academy of Medicine, National Medical Association, and American Academy of Pediatrics. Dr. Gale was awarded the Chicago Mayor's Medal of Honor for her work on COVID relief and recovery for the city. In the eye of the COVID-19 pandemic, Dr. Gale developed a partnership between the United Way and Chicago Community Trust to establish the Chicago COVID Relief Fund. This collaboration generated $35 million to help Chicagoans hit the hardest by the pandemic and provided resources like food and shelter and even cash to pay bills. Her care, concern, and advocacy for her community is evident in every aspect of her work. Dr. Gale has been named one of Forbes' 100 Most Powerful Women and one of the nonprofit Times Power and Influence Top 50. She's authored numerous articles on global and domestic public health issues, poverty alleviation, gender equality, and social justice. Dr. Gale was born and raised in Buffalo, New York. She earned a bachelor of Arts in Psychology at Bernard College, an MD at the University of Pennsylvania, and an MPH at Johns Hopkins University. She's also received 18 honorary degrees and holds faculty appointments at the University of Washington and Emory University. 
In this episode, Dr. Gail shares ways philanthropy agencies can strengthen and uplift nonprofits led by Black, Indigenous, and other people of color, aka BIPOC led nonprofits, which is a cornerstone of racial justice in philanthropy. Dr. Gail even gives us a window to how the Chicago Community Trust is helping to strengthen BIPOC-led agencies and position them for success as they carry out their mission-critical work within the region. Without further ado, good people, let's get into it. Hang tight as I bring Dr. Gale to the Black Fundraisers podcast stage. Hello, Dr. Gale. Thank you so much for stopping by and hanging out with us here on the Black Fundraisers podcast. How are you? I'm great. Good to be with you. It's great to have you. You got to tell us a fun and little known fact about yourself. Fun fact is I have a Wheaties box with my picture on it. (laughs) No kidding, a Wheaties box? Yeah. It was made for me because I, in one of my jobs, we had a relationship with General Mills, who makes Wheaties. And I was speaking at a town hall to the General Mills team, and they presented me with my own Wheaties box with my picture on it. So I have it in my office. It never went to the supermarket, so there was never a Wheaties box that was sold with my picture on it, but I do have one. That is a fun fact, Dr. Gale. Thank you for sharing that. (laughs) Thank you. Dr. Gale, for the benefit of listeners who may not be aware, you earned an MD at the University of Pennsylvania, an MPH at John Hopkins University, and have been a strident voice around racial inequities in public health and its impact on people and communities of color. We've seen you amplifying the CDC's message or classification of racism as a public health crisis even last year. You wrote an article entitled Experts Perspectives, Tackling Racism as a Public Health Issue Starts at Home, which I will be sharing with the good people listening in today's show notes. And just bear with me for a moment. I think it's important to share some of the contents of that article you said, and I will quote you, while increasing diversity in the numbers of people of color at all levels of our public health institutions is critical, it's only the first step. We also must commit to making our workplaces inclusive and equitable, embracing our different experiences, and supporting each one's ability to offer their unique contributions and to thrive within their organizations. You went on to ask the question, are we willing and open to hearing voices different than our own? Are we willing to create spaces in which people feel comfortable to express diverse perspectives? If not, the promise of diversity, inclusion, and equity will not be fulfilled. To achieve this requires an organization-wide commitment to specific and measurable diversity, equity, and inclusion goals and targets, including accountability tied to performance goals and other organization incentives. You said a mouthful, and I think you're absolutely right. We know the lack of diversity and inclusion in public health has always been an issue preceding the George Floyd murder. Right. And we know that the COVID-19 pandemic, coupled with the summer of protests, only laid bare what we know to be centuries of racial inequities. So my question for you, Dr. Gale, is two parts. I'd like to hear from you. What will it take to achieve more inclusive and equitable workplaces within our public health system? And secondly, I'd like for you to talk about the ways you're leveraging your influence to promote equity in Chicago's nonprofit landscape. Well, thank you. What it will take, first of all, is for all of us to be believers that diversity matters. You know, we talk about diversity, and oftentimes we talk about it from the standpoint of it being the right and the just thing to do, and it is. We are a multicultural, multiracial, multi ethnic society. And it makes sense and it's the right thing and it's the just thing to make sure that everybody has the opportunity to participate in it. But it's also what gets us the best answers. 
But I think about public health or any other discipline, we're problem solvers. We're trying to think about how do we improve the health of the nation or how do we achieve economic equity, all these things that we think about when you think about solving problems. And it doesn't need to be that problem. It can be in the context of the private sector being able to increase profits and grow market share, et cetera. No matter what problem we're trying to solve, having diverse perspectives matters. Any of us knows what it's like to sit around and talk with our friends and people who think like us. We end up circulating the same ideas over and over again. But when you get people who actually have diverse ways of thinking about a problem, you come up with the best solution. And when we're talking about problems that impact people of color, it is important that we have those voices at the table, those lived experiences, people who understand the communities because they come from the communities. I just believe strongly that diversity, equity, inclusion starts with a belief that diversity matters, that having the right voices at the table matter. Then you have to be intentional about it and really look at how are you going about getting diversity? Where, what networks are you using? Who are you thinking about as you look outside of your organization, your institution, to make sure that you're casting the kind of net that brings the kind of diversity in? And making sure you're thinking about what, whether you want to call them targets or goals or what have you, but really, what would a diverse workplace look like to you? And are you, in fact, intentional about reaching that? And then finally, as you read some of the comments from the article, are you making sure that once you, you invite people inside of your house, if you will, that you're making sure that they feel comfortable, that they make sure that they, are, that they feel they can bring their best self, their whole self, bring them their authentic self? Because if you invite people in, but then don't use their voice and don't make them feel comfortable to use that voice that they have, then it's just a numbers game. And so we need to get beyond the numbers game to really thinking about how do we build the diversity, but how do we also build the inclusion and importantly, also the equity so that people can be successful as they enter into new situations. Yeah, I agree. Otherwise, it just feels like diversity management, right? Right. Right. Changing the mix or the blend who you're recruiting, but it's the result is more the same and folks aren't experiencing inclusion and belonging. You're not feeling like your organization is changing as a result of that diversity. And I think that's where the inclusion uh, comes in. You want to feel like because you have different voices at the table, because you have broader diversity, the organization changes as well. What kind of feedback are you receiving from public health agencies around this call to diversify and embrace diversity and inclusion? This was written for the CDC and for their blog on diversity. And I've talked to a lot of my former colleagues at CDC. I was at CDC for 20 years. You know, they really were incredibly encouraged not just by what I wrote, but by the fact that the CDC director actually, for the first time, said that racism was a public health issue and that if we didn't attack and address the issue of racism, we can't address and the gaps that we see between communities of color and the white community in America. And so I think people within the agency really were very encouraged not only by my words, but the fact that the CDC director, the highest leadership role, acknowledged that we have to face this if we're going to do our job as public health professionals. And as I talk to other public health people in the field, you know, I think there was a real excitement about the leading public health agency for the nation, the nation's prevention agency, actually coming out and addressing this in, in such a forceful way. I was personally really encouraged by it when it happened. I was very surprised. I did breathe a sigh of relief, if you will. I mean, because for someone like me who's fundraising for the CDC to come forth with this, and when I think about the health disparities, when I think about education inequity, 
and its impact on students in Southeast DC, for instance. And I just got out of a meeting with a community member who likened some of the harrowing stories that she'd heard about children in Ward 8 suffering in DC, not having access to food in the pandemic, clean clothes, socks, the ability to wash clothes and launder clothes and living in these food deserts. Everybody couldn't Instacart to get right. through the pandemic if you wanted food, right? And she likened some of what she saw in Southeast DC to some of her experiences working abroad in abjectly impoverished communities. I felt like the elephant in the room had been kind of called out by its name. Yeah, well, for um, those of us in public health, and that's not just people of color, but I think people in public health overall, you know, have recognized for a long time the, the role that racism plays in health disparities. And so I think it was really, in many ways, a breath of fresh air and a validation of what so many of us have been struggling to get acknowledged for far too long. The second part of your question, you asked kind of about the networks of nonprofits here in Chicago. I would say one of the things that has been really gratifying since I came to Chicago um, is that there is a strong network, people of color leading organizations here, nonprofits. And uh, we have a group as an example of women of color who are CEOs and, and presidents of major foundations here. And we've got a moment in many ways where we've got leaders of color who are in positions to really make a difference. And so one of the things we've continued to do is to build our networks, to make sure that we have people who, are, who know each other, who are sharing information, who are looking out for each other, who are thinking about who are the, what's the next generation of leaders. So this moment in time where we have leaders of color in positions that can make a difference, that it's not just a moment that we're actually looking at who's going to fill our role when we leave and are we thinking about building that next generation of leadership and i just think building that leadership cadre and making sure that we're thinking about how to keep that pipeline going is going to be so important as we continue to think about how do we move towards a more just and equal society when you think about those diverse organizations BIPOC-led organizations and knowing that the philanthropy sector has a troubling past. Um, research has proven that there's been inequitable giving to nonprofits led by people of color, Black, Latinx, and otherwise. And I'd like to hear from you, what kind of resources is the Chicago Community Trust availing to support and uplift and, and even or even build capacity within those BIPOC-led nonprofits. We're making it an explicit part of our strategy. About two years ago, developed a new strategy focused on closing the racial and ethnic wealth gap and really looking at how do we decrease the gap in wealth between Black and Latinx and, and white communities here in a city that is two thirds black and Latinx. So again, know that it's the right thing to do, but it's also the smart thing to do. You can't move forward in an economy when you're holding two thirds of your population back. So, you know, we feel strongly that to do that, we also have to uplift those communities and we've got to make sure that our funding uh, streams um, go to support and build capacity at the community level. And so we have, a pretty explicit plan to continue to do that, to really look at how are we building that capacity, because it is the cornerstone of how we're going to create change. When I think about how vital BIPOC-led organizations are, we know that communities of color bear the brunt of just about any inequity you name. And the way I see it is these nonprofits led by people of color, community knows what community needs, right? And they're on the front lines serving those communities. And I'm reminded organizations that I relied on as a little girl way back when in Oakland, California, the neighborhood centers, the feeding programs, the sheer thought that 
they're underfunded, yet the sh when you look at the sheer volume that they contend with, the demand for their services, it's just really frightening to me. And it's encouraging when I read statements from leaders like you, like I read your announcement in 2019 about the Chicago Communities Trust commitment to closing that wealth gap. Those kinds of commitments are really, really vital. I mean, I just feel as though it's essential that we uplift these organizations and in a way that really builds power and voice within them. What are some ways that you feel the philanthropy community can build power and voice within BIPOC-led organizations? Well, I think there's multiple ways. First of all, we have to believe that, as you said, they hold the power for creating positive change in their communities, and they know what needs to be done. A lot of times, or smaller organizations, they may not have all the capacity, they may not have all the tools, they do know their community. And I think it's our job to give them the resources to develop, to grow, and to flourish. We oftentimes give money to larger established organizations that tend to be led by non-people of color because they have the capacity. All organizations started small at some point, and it's because people invested in them that they grew. So there's no magic to it. We can grow organizations led by people of color if we, in fact, provide those kinds of resources. And so for us, it's an explicit activity to make sure that we're doing that and also that we're listening to those voices. And we've done a lot, in fact, before we developed our strategy. I spent about a year. I was new to Chicago, new to the community foundation world. I spent almost a year just listening, going into, into communities, hearing what was on their minds, and really then responding to what we thought the, the greatest needs were. And I think by inviting voices in, we learn so much. We changed as an organization, even how we make our grants. You know, we do a lot more general operating funds as opposed to dictating how you use your funds, saying to an organization, we believe in you. We believe that you know what you need to spend your resources on. So we're going to give you money just to support your organization. That's the hardest money for most nonprofits to come by because most people give grants as project grants. We still do project-related grants too, but we also do a lot of general operating support. We're also doing a lot of work just providing technical capacity to organizations so that they get what they need to be able to grow their capacity, grow their organization. So we put a lot of focus on that and building leaders, especially young leaders in the community, um, community organizers, you know, people who really are at the grassroots level, because that's where change is sustained by really building that at that grassroots level. I'm hearing you say listening, right, being open to the conversation and inviting those voices in, those community members, grassroots, engaging with your BIPOC constituents, right, and yeah. investing, investing in that capacity building, investing in, in leaders, and not looking at this so short-sighted that we're not considering the need to invest in that next generation of diverse nonprofit leaders. And we've also invited community in to do what we call participatory grant making. So as opposed to us saying, here's what we're going to put a request for proposals out for, we go and ask community, what do you think the needs are so that we can actually develop our grant proposals request for grant proposals based on what communities say their needs are. So I think there's a lot of ways in which we've really tried to change the way we do business so that we're in partnership with community. Now, we're a foundation. Power dynamics are such that we're all, we always recognize that who holds the purse often holds the power. But to the extent that we can, we're really looking at ways in which we can shift that so that we're working in much more in a partnership mode. I'm really encouraged uh, by that. 
And this is partly why I thought it was so important to have these conversations with you and some of your contemporaries. So I wanna pivot to what I consider to be the more fun aspect of the conversation, although I could have these conversations with folks like yourself all day long and I find it to be fun. It's, it's, it's what I do and what I love. My question for you is this, Dr. Gale, I always enjoy visiting Chicago because from my observation, a couple of times that I've been there, I came to the conclusions that Chicagoans and me being a California girl have a couple of things in common. I love that people from Chicago seem to love their food and their whiskey. And I love both mm -hmm. as well. I learned that very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. Chicago take their meals very seriously. With that, I'd like to know, since you came to Chicago, what are some of your staples? Where are you eating and what are you eating there in Chicago? <laughs> Having just come through a pandemic, mostly what I've been eating is my own home cooking. <laughs> <laughs> I heard that. Chicago is restaurant rich. And one of the things that I just find so wonderful about Chicago, I mean, downtown, there are wonderful, excellent restaurants that are rated multiple stars on, on anybody's um, list. But, and I love, there are many of them that I love, but you know, what, what is unique about Chicago is the neighborhoods and the restaurants in the different neighborhoods. You can get some of the best Asian food. You can get some of the best Greek food. You can get some of the best, you know, soul food. You can get soul vegan. You can get regular. So the variety and the cuisines that you can get here from countries that many people don't even exist. And so that's what I love about the scene here is Yes, we've got some of the best expensive high class restaurants. In fact, I think we often score, you know, number one or two in competing with San Francisco or New York. So we've got all that, but it's really the neighborhood restaurants. And you can go to some of these small restaurants. You know, we've got this big Latinx community, some of the best Mexican restaurants, Brazilian restaurants. I can go on and on and on naming the cuisines, but um that's the part about it. You know, I can eat my way through the neighborhoods. <laughs> yeah, I really enjoy the food. I have yet to have a piece of the Chicago deep dish pizza. I don't think that I've had any authentic Chicago deep dish pizza, but I've had a great steak. Don't ask me the name of the restaurant. Uh -huh. One of those that's on that list. Haven't had Harrow's. I've heard about it, though. I've heard that it's all the rage. So my favorite restaurant, or one of my very favorites, is down in a, a restaurant in the south side called Virtue. Black-owned, excellent. He's won, the chef, uh, Eric Williams, has won all sorts of awards. And one of the things that was really great is during the pandemic, he turned his restaurant into service and made sure that he was getting meals out to hospital workers on the south side, made sure that he had food delivery available for people who needed food. One of the things about Chicago, including the restaurant scene, is how people rally to really help their neighbors. So that's one of my favorite restaurants, not only because of food, but also because of uh, the way and the integrity with which he runs his business. Yeah, that's, that's a beautiful thing when you have um, ordinary people doing what I consider to be extraordinary things, showing that, showing that love and just holding up your community. That, and that's why I am so passionate about nonprofits, particularly those that could use a little TLC and capacity building, because I'm aware that there are some ordinary people running these organizations that are really holding up neighborhoods. Communities are resting on their shoulders. And these are people that may not make CNN heroes, but the rewards of the remarkable work that they're doing are enjoyed by their community members that need them the most. Yes. Right? So I want to just thank you, Dr. Gale, for having this conversation with me. And thank you for all of the 
wonderful work, the tireless work that you have been doing in public health, in the philanthropy sector. If nobody's thanked you today, let me thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. That means a whole lot to me. It means a lot. Thank you. And for the good people listening, I hope that you've enjoyed this conversation and count on me to share those data points, those, those articles in the show notes. And we're going to continue the conversation. You to subscribe so you never miss an episode. And until next week, stay tuned, stay down, and keep your head up. Thanks for listening to the Black Fundraisers podcast. Like what you're hearing? Subscribe to the Black Fundraisers podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. And leave a five-star review. Connect with Kia on LinkedIn, Instagram. Hello, thanks so much for stopping by. I am Kia Kroon, and I'm a fundraising professional and DEI champion. I am in pursuit of racial justice for people of color and communities of color. I'd love to explore ways we can work together to change the world. 